uh, international NGOs um, such as those who are members of Accountable Now work in highly diverse contexts, diverse linguistically and diverse culturally. Uh, they work across countries and territories that encompass hundreds of uh, dialects and different cultural norms and mores and they have to negotiate this very complex environment um, at whilst trying to deliver on those goals and meet those principles of accountability. So how do we deal with that challenge? That's something that we wanted to investigate in this project and we wanted to come up with concrete policy recommendations and what we would do at the end of this uh, presentation is explain to you what those policy recommendations are so you've got take home messages at the end of it. Um, it's, I just want to uh, say that uh, this is quite a timely project because 2019 is uh, the UN's year of indigenous languages and there's increasing recognition in UN circles that linguistic inclusivity is essential to the goal of leaving no one behind and in fact there's been a couple of symposiums which Vina and I myself are going to at the uh, UN which examine exactly this, the role of language in achieving the SDGs. So um, hopefully we all recognise then that language is important. Uh, yet a curiosity is that languages tend to have a low profile in the development sector. Language policies are not often in place within NGOs Funding for translation and interpretation tends to be limited and monitoring and evaluation processes usually omit references to languages. Right, Bina. Yes, uh, thank you Angela for explaining that and for handing over to me. Um, so just briefly, my name is Vina Tesser. I'm currently at Ghent University, but I was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Reading uh, while I was working on this project, uh, which was led by um, Professor Hilary Footit, also at Reading. Um, so I will uh, tell you a bit more about um, our research approach, our research questions and data and methods before handing back over to Angela, who will tell you uh, more about some of our findings. Um, so the starting point of our research uh, was really that NGOs um, in their discourse often say that they listen to the communities that they wish to empower or to their beneficiaries. Um, they listen to their voices. Um, however, there's very little uh, talk about the role of languages within this context, although we can assume that uh, when local communities speak, they do this, this in their local languages, and that communication between NGOs and um, local communities will not be without its problems. Um, so this for us um, was an interesting starting point, particularly considering that there was a lack of academic study and also sectoral um, studies on the role of languages uh, within listening and within development. So on the slide, you can see, for example, on the right hand side, there's a screenshot of um, a research uh, project that's being conducted uh, by ALNAP called Time to Listen, um, in which 6,000 people who were on the receiving end of aid were interviewed um, about um, how they were being listened to, um, yet there was there was little consideration of the role of languages and translation within this. So this encouraged us to, to question how NGOs listen and what the role of language policies and practices are within that listening, as well as the role of cultural knowledge. So um, our research questions then um, that we took as our starting point um, were firstly, what is the role of languages in power relations in development work? So how do languages shape um, power dynamics? Um, how much organizational awareness is there of languages and language policy? And what is the provision of language cultural mediation, um, including translators and interpreters? Now, in addition, other uh, aspects we were interested in were how um, NGOs approaches to listening and languages have approached over the years. And finally, uh, we were also interested in um, the role of the donor uh, within um, the, the uh, development chain, so to speak, and the influence um, that um, donors um, 
uh, approach or understanding of listening and languages had on what NGOs are actually doing. And um, this was particularly an aspect that Angela was interested in um, with her work. So in terms of our data and methods and what we actually investigated during the three years that we were working on this project, well, in our first year, we looked at the archives um, of uh, the donors, so DFIDs, um, which is what Angela took care of, and then uh, secondly, the archives of um, four uh, main development NGOs that we worked with, which were Christian Aid, Oxfam, Save the Children, and Tear Funds. Um, Tear Funds archives are not actually officially deposited, so we mainly relied on oral history interviews um, for this approach. Um, during the second year, we then interviewed uh, people working for these four big NGOs, as well as for DFID, which again was Angela's responsibility. Um, and for the NGO staff, we interviewed a mix of people, either based in UK-based headquarters or uh, within the countries, and we conducted these interviews over Skype. Um, this gave us a really good basis to then do some more in-depth work um, during the third year, um, we did three case studies on Malawi, Peru and Kyrgyzstan. We each visited one of these countries, so um, Angela has been to Malawi, I myself went to Kyrgyzstan and Hilary Footit uh, visited Peru. Uh, we spoke to about 35, we did about 35 interviews, held conversations with people. Um, this was a mix of NGO staff, so working for international NGOs, but also people working for local uh, partner organizations. Uh, we also interviewed a number of academics working in these countries um, that were specialized in either development or translation, and also a number of uh, language practitioners who were working as translators or interpreters in the development context. Now, based on all of this data, um, we produced a report with some findings and recommendations, and that is what we will pre be presenting in the remainder of the talk. So I'll now hand over to Angela, who will talk about her findings of her research in Malawi. Thank you very much, Vina. Um, as you can appreciate from Vina's outline, it was a very rich and diverse project and uh, because of the pressures of time I'm only going to concentrate on the findings from the Malawi case study. However, the findings from my case study also applied across the other country case studies as well. So it gives you a flavour not only of the local context but also of the more general um, learnings that we took from this project. If at the end of the Q&As you want to ask more questions about the findings from the other country case studies or the interviews with different officials then feel free free to do so. Um, but for the next few slides, I'm just going to concentrate on what I uncovered in Malawi. And I conducted uh, 35 interviews in uh, three uh, in Lalongwe, Zomba and Blantyre, and that included respondents from international NGOs, um, Malawian NGOs, community-based organizations, and those who worked for donor organizations and um, who were translators for NGOs. And these were some of the key messages. I've separated them out into two themes. First of all, issues connected with donors, and second of all, issues connected with communities. Well, um, one of the, uh, one of the um, findings that related to NGOs which were based either nationally or locally, and whose primary language was not English, is that they found it very difficult to um, access funding because the chances of receiving funding were de are dependent, they felt largely, on fluency in the language of the donor. So in other words, donor organizations, and there are important exceptions, but donor organizations do not tend to invite applications for funding in local languages. So it means that, um, that in order to have the best chance of accessing that funding, you need to be fluent in usually English. And it's not just English, but it's, um, a, a very, it's, it's an English which, it, which incorporates a technical jargon of development work that uses the donor's buzzwords. And if you do not have that fluency, then you're automatically at a disadvantage in a funding competition. Now, uh, I said that there's, an except, there's exceptions to this, 
For example, USAID has recently invited applications into Chewa, which is great, <coughs> but that's, um, that doesn't seem to be common practice. So here's a quote, a quote from a, one interview of mine, who uh, someone who worked for a, a donor organization, who said um, essentially that you can get local community-based organizations that have fantastic ideas, and if you listen to them in Chichewa or their local language, they, they will tell you what they can do to move from A to B. But because they cannot present what they're saying in English, they can't get any funding. They never access grants. Um, we also found uh, in the funding applications that we scanned and we were told about that translation and interpretation costs are typically not budgeted for. Those are funding applications in uh, at all different types of levels of organizations, international uh, to national and local. Um, that, that typically is not a um, specific explicit budget line for translation and interpretation costs. Sometimes it can be bundled up into a budget line for communication, but they're not explicitly there. And I think that that's important because it just goes to uh, explain why translation and interpretation costs, uh, costs do tend to be under-resourced and underfunded and devalued, that they're, that they're treated more as an afterthought. You get the money in for your project, and after that you think, okay, how are we actually going to translate um, what we're doing, how can we translate our goals and our objectives in our funding application to, um, to our practice on the ground. And the reason why this is important is that our interviewees were very emphatic that they felt that project effectiveness is impaired if communities do not understand project objectives. Um, the, the aims of dynamic accountability, participation, inclusion, feedback, two-way dialogue cannot be achieved if that a common language is not being shared. Um, so that's, if community does not understand aims, objectives, is not able to contribute, is not is able to participate in decision making, is not able to it's to uh, provide feedback or be confident that their feedback would be fully understood, then uh, it's very, it's, uh, an organization would not be able to be accountable and effective within such a context. I've got a quote here from a chairperson of a Malawian based organization who uh, provided me with an anecdote of a project that his organization was delivering, which the local staff didn't fully understand. And I just included this to show that the problems with language do not just affect NGOs to communities, but also are problematic within organizations themselves that are multilingual. Um, so this interviewee said that he's never done any project where they do an assessment of whether communities have understood what we're now doing. Sometimes we assume that people understand. And he told me about a time when he had a certain project and discovered that half of the project staff members in his institution didn't understand it. They were busy at running up and down, always busy, busy, busy. And later on, we discovered that these people didn't know exactly what this project was about, end quote. Uh, so now to move to community issues. Um, a problem here, um, many of our interviewees said, and this is not just in Malawi, but all of our country case studies, is that they find it difficult that there's no direct translation for NGO and development buzzwords, um, which are international and are conceived in English terms. So, uh, for example, uh, my interviewees were saying, you know what, there's not a direct equivalent in Chichewa and the other local languages in Malawi for really with terms that are really basic to development, such as um, gender and inequality, democracy, human rights, resilience, sustainability, climate change, all of these, uh, accountability as well, all of these different words do not have a direct equivalent. And that doesn't mean that you can't translate them. You can translate them, but it takes time because you have to think of a way of translating them that retains the essence of the meaning, but it will also make sense to the local people. So uh, what these interviewees did is, uh, because in the absence of receiving 
guidance that they felt they needed from headquarters, they often came up with ad hoc solutions on the ground. And uh, they would they said that they made use of stories and metaphors and proverbs, and they engaged in these long explanations trying to get to the essence of what the English words meant. And they weren't always confident that they were successful in that. So that was tough for them. And what's also tough is trying to interpret words which are considered taboo. So um, anything surrounding uh, sex and sexual health and reproduction, all of these words are considered taboo and it's, it's not something that can be easily translated um, if you want to ensure that you are communicating in a sensitive way and that you, are, that you can maintain community buy-in. So what they do is to use euphemisms. And the problem is that euphemisms change from uh, community to community or between different generations, uh, that they would be very heavily local. So you needed a really good understanding of how that community talks and their local realities in order to be able to use euphemisms well. Um, so it's very tough. And the quote I've got here on the screen gives you an indication of um, the types of things I'm talking about. So this interviewee says, quote, there's some areas where if you're talking about reproduction, for example, you have to be very aware of the culture. Telling them about natural family planning, for instance, it sounds so much easier and light to tell these terms in English. It's neutral. But when it gets to the language in terms of gender dynamics, you need to be very, very careful in what you're saying. For a term that's neutral in English, when it gets to Chichewa, you may find you need to use different terms for men and women. End quote. And that's something that I found to be, it seems to be quite a common practice um, that in dealing with these different issues that, that men and women would be separated into different groups and different messages would be crafted towards those gender groups. And often an older generation and younger generation you have to be separated as well. And if you're not working at the field level, it can be very difficult to understand just how much time and energy this takes and how much local knowledge is required. Um, so it, we didn't just encounter um, examples of problems and challenges and difficulties. We also uh, found exam many examples of good practice. And um, for instance, uh, the interviewees I spoke to uh, tried to recruit local interpreters wherever they could. Um, and here's a quote from a program manager of an INGO that's active in Malawi. Quote, we try as much as possible, if you don't know the language of that particular area, to train one or two or three people within that community who can deliver the same material, the same issues to the community within their own language. For example, if we're going to, into the north where they speak Tumbuka, we normally have Tumbuka speakers within the community that you train. And those that you train, they are the ones who now end up explaining things better to their colleagues. Without that, it's very difficult for you to implement because you don't know language is cultural, end quote. So it's very important to have uh, long-term relationships with communities and to try to sustain um, relationships with those who have some background in interpreting. And um, uh, and it's, it's not always easy to do if you're bouncing around from community to community. And something that's important to bear in mind is that accessing these interpreters will often be dependent upon permission granted from the gatekeeper, who could be the village chief, for example. Um, so it's, it's, it's a long process to be able to gain the trust needed and the depth of the relationships needed to communicate effectively and in a respectful way with the communities that you want to work with. And a problem, of course, is that for many NGOs, time is what they do not have, particularly in the context of, very, of, of projects with, that have a very tight turnaround. So um, after these findings, we came up with policy recommendations for NGOs, and I will turn over to Vina so she can outline to you what those were. Thank you very much for that, um, Angela. Um, so from all of the research we've done, the three case studies, as well as um, the year one archival research and the year two interviews um, with NGO staff, um, we came up um, with a set of recommendations. Um, 
And as something I wanted to add to what I said before about uh, data and methods is the reason why we chose to focus on uh, Malawi, Kyrgyzstan and Peru. And there were a number of different reasons, but probably the most important one to highlight is that we chose those countries because the status of English is different in all three of them, um, which of course might have an impact on how these UK-based uh, international NGOs deal with languages in development. So in Malawi, English is an official language and it's widely spoken in the international development sector. Um, in Peru, it's not an official language, but it's widely taught. English is widely taught in schools. In Kyrgyzstan, only about half a percent to a percent uh, estimated of the population is able to speak English. So obviously this means um, that the, the language issues we encountered uh, were potentially quite different. Um, nevertheless, we found that a lot of the challenges that uh, NGOs and their local partners encountered were very similar. And um, on the basis of this, we came up with uh, the following recommendations. So firstly, um, when planning a project, um, we recommend recommended to NGOs that it's very important to think about language from the very early stages of um, designing a project and to listen to the words that the community uses at the needs assessment stage so that you ensure that the communities understand what you are trying to do and that your own goals are embedded um, in the local community. Secondly, uh, people outside the UK, so our in-country interviewees, both in the second year and the third year, emphasise the role of languages in creating relationships of trust. This is why one of our recommendations is um, that it's important to provide language support during the early discussions um, with communities to try to establish um, these relationships of trust. Learning the local language was considered as even better although admittedly and um, this is not always possible but in the words of some of our interviewees for example learning the language helps to break barriers that translation can't or learning the language shows motivation and efforts and this is from my Kyrgyz interviewees local people will appreciate NGOs efforts NGO staff's efforts to learn local languages and their attitude will change there will be more trust because language um, is a bridge of trust uh, we also recommended that NGOs uh, include a budget line for translation and interpreting because, as Angela said, this was often missing in the examples we encountered. Then, when starting a project and during monitoring and evaluation, we said it would be uh, important to translate successful project applications as well as final reports into local languages to increase stakeholder involvement and ownership. Um, in my case, I'm referring um, to my own case study on Kyrgyzstan, and there was um, many interviewees complained of the lack of access, that there was very little sharing of uh, the learning by international NGOs, because the final reports would often be um, directed at donors and published in English, but would not be translated into Kyrgyz or into Russian. Um, and as I said before, considering about 1% of the population speaks English, this means that local experts and local NGO workers are not able to access those results. Another point was uh, it's important to feed back to the community regularly and to adapt practice accordingly to make sure um, that your project is understood and um, that it is working in the local context. And then finally, uh, local in working with local interpreters uh, wherever possible was seen as important because they are embedded in the local community, so it will be easier to establish trust uh, with the local communities, although admittedly um, this is not always um, without problems. Um, one of the biggest challenges um, NGO staff reported was that local interpreters and translators often lack um, the knowledge of uh, the development jargon. So this is why um, we recommended seeking to establish a register of translators and interpreters who have a good understanding of this discourse and of development. And we have one more slide, I think, with a few recommendations. 
Angela, yeah. Um, so uh, finally, we have a number of recommendations to support uh, southern NGOs and communities in local capacity buildings. Um, so one of them was uh, to produce local glossaries of key terms in local languages, and this is work that can be done in collaboration with southern NGOs and local communities, and to share this as a common resource. Um, to share learning on um, language practices and uh, solutions through existing NGO networks. And then these two final ones were particularly relevant um, for my Kyrgyz uh, groups, uh, Kyrgyz interviewees, um, to consider providing skills training in a language that is accessible to southern NGOs. Um, in the Kyrgyz context, for example, this meant that whereas in the past these training sessions were often um, provided in Russian, um, there was an increasing need to provide such training in Kyrgyz and this was actually a problem for uh, many of the southern NGOs who often only had a capacity in, in Russian. Um, and finally, uh, considering providing access to English language training was something that came up very strongly um, with my Kyrgyz interviewees who said that um, they felt if they could uh, learn English better, it would increase their access to knowledge, their access to training, but it would also give them an opportunity to share their own knowledge and their own um, activities with a wider international audience, um, which I think is something that is very important. Um, so these were our, some of our main recommendations and I'll hand uh, over again to Angela now. Thank you very much. Um, we didn't actually, we've just chosen to focus on the recommendations for INGOs today because we thought those were obviously most relevant to the audience, but our final report also contains recommendations for donors. Uh, so you may be interested in reading more about that as well as reading um, in further detail about our other country case studies. Um, it, it's a shame that our project lead, Professor Hilary Futtick, cannot be here with us today. Um, but if you would like more information about the project, do please feel free to contact her or to contact myself. Uh, Vina was our postdoctoral researcher and we couldn't have done the project without her. Um, and I'm so glad she could present with me today. Unfortunately, she's moved on. She's moved institutions now, um, gone on to pastures new so it, so it would be best to contact either Hillary or I if you do want further information. Uh, you can download our project uh, reports which was produced alongside our project partner in track and um, if you click on the link on that website you will uh, click on the link on the slide you will go to our website where you can download the project report in a number of different languages. We have it available in English, French, Spanish, uh, Chichewa, Russian, um, and uh, if uh, I, I know it's probably going to take a while for the uh, for this webinar to be uploaded. So if you can't wait for that, then uh, just Google "listening zones of NGOs" and you'll come to our project website and not and find not only the report but we also have a variety of, of different information there that we've collected alongside the project. There's uh, audiovisual material as well as other documents to download. Um, so that wraps up our presentation and we'd be very glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Angela. Um, we will make sure we also share with you the email addresses as well as the, the resources Angela just mentioned in our follow-up email. So I would like to now hand over to you, uh, the participants of the webinar and see um, whether you have any questions. We have already received a question from Alexandra in the chat box. Um, part of it, I think, has been answered by your recommendation. But Alexandra, do you, do you want to step in and um, ask your question? You can unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone button. 